it was pointed out to him that astrology would fall as a science by his definition. And to everyone's absolute astonishment, when he was asked this question, he agreed with the assertion that under his definition, astrology would count as a science and could be taught in scientific classrooms. Whenever I speak to gatherings of teachers or lay people interested in education, I always try to remind them that the leading scientific expert in favor of intelligent design under oath at the Dover trial got on the stand and lo and behold, he said that if intelligent design is considered science, so is astrology. I don't think that's where we want to take the scientific classrooms in this country, especially when we are involved in an international competition that will determine whether or not the United States remains the leading scientific nature in, nation in the world. I don't think teaching astrology in the science classroom is going to be the key to our re retaining worldwide leadership in science. Um, there's another point that you hear sometimes as well, and that is the scientific community is biased against intelligent design, and we don't treat new ideas. We suppress them. We keep them out. So it's only fair to put intelligent design in the classroom. What this argument overlooks is the fact that science deals with novel scientific ideas all the time. It's the lock, it's sort of the stock lock and barrel of science. It's the sort of thing that we love to have. So what happens with a new idea, with a novel scientific claim? Well, the people who back it go out and they do research. They subject that research to peer review. And peer review means you write, you come to meetings, you argue, you debate, you accept criticism, you do counter experiments. In short, you try to establish that your idea has the evidence behind it and that it's useful. And eventually, if you really have the evidence behind you, you'll win a scientific consensus. And then quite automatically, these new ideas get into classroom and textbook. Just as an example, six years ago, the notion of a process called RNA interference as being responsible for genetic regulation was unheard of. Then all of a sudden the evidence be behind it began to mount and it is now clear that small interfering RNA molecules play a major role in development, differentiation, and gene expression. Textbook writers everywhere, and I'm one of them, are now putting this material into the textbooks. Not because state boards of education required it, but because the scientific community reached a consensus that this process is important. Now the people who advocate intelligent design like to say, we got a new scientific theory too. Be fair to us. That's cool. If they wanted to go through this process, I'd say, great. See you at the next biochemical society meetings. See you at the cell biology meetings. Let's look at your evidence. Let's subject it to peer review. But do you know what they want to do? They don't like this. They think this process is too messy and too time consuming. Their idea of how things should work is actually more like this, which is to be directly injected into classroom and textbook. And wherever they have gotten the attention of boards of education of leg and, or legislatures, they have consistently acted to short circuit the very process of science. I would argue then, far from being unfair to exclude this idea from the curriculum, it's actually unfair to include it without making it go through the process of review, debate, evidence, and experimentation that every other scientific idea, including evolution, has had to go through in order to get into classroom, textbook, and curriculum. Intelligent design creationism, in my view, is not rejected, as some people say, because it has religious implications. I think a lot of ideas have religious implications, and they still find their way into science. The reason these ideas are rejected is far simpler. And the headlines from these scientific papers tell you exactly what that reason is. And that is that these ideas have been rejected by the scientific and the science education community for a far simpler reason. And that reason is because the evidence shows it's wrong. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Now, I was asked a question that I sort of deferred earlier on, like, how do you fit this in with your religious views? And I told you that Colbert had asked me that question, and I figured, I'll show you my answer to it.
So I hope that's a more detailed answer to your question. Okay. Sir, in the striped shirt. Um, over time, like, uh, like larger mammals, they became gradually smaller as they evolved. Is there a reason for this? Or, because I was reading an article yesterday, and is there, like, you, we had like the giant sloth, and we don't have giant sloths anymore. Is there a reason to this? Okay, or? well, what you're asking me about, is there an evolutionary trend to make animals smaller? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got a question for you. Sorry to throw the question back at you. Mm -hmm. What's the largest animal, animal that has ever lived? Not Anybody sure. else know? Blue whale. Okay, it's still here. So not all evolutionary trends reduce the size of animals. And it depends upon local circumstances and nutritional circumstances. There's actually a very well understood trend in ecology and evolution that when large animals find themselves on very isolated islands with limited food sources and other evolutionary pressures, they tend to get smaller. And the reason for that, of course, is a smaller animal has uh, fewer metabolic demands, um, can get by with less food, and you might, might be in a limited area where that actually happens. But evolutionary trends go in both directions. They go towards the larger and they go towards the smaller. Um, so I don't think any one trend uh, characterizes evolution. And the persistence of the blue whale alive today, the largest animal that has ever existed, I think is a good indication of that. Okay. Um, right there, sir. Um, how long do you think it might take for the whole debate over evolution to be resolved? <laughs> how long do I think it would take for the debate over evolution to be resolved? My short answer is not in my lifetime. Um, this is something that people have been kicking around for a long time. And it's not a uniquely American debate either. It turns out there's a very strong intelligent design movement in Great Britain. Uh, this movement has made strides in the Middle East. Turkey, for example, actually the country of Turkey, actually surpasses the United States in the percentage of its people that reject the theory of evolution because there's substantial anti-evolution activity in the Islamic world. Um, I think it's going to be around for a long time. There are always going to be people who, for one reason or another, reject the theory of evolution in spite of the overwhelming scientific evidence behind it. But I do think this, and that is that right now in the United States, this has reached a point of such controversy where you have people running for public office being asked to comment about it, school board elections being decided by this one way or another. It's reached a point where we're actually at, at what the, the, the systems analyst guy would call a tipping point. And I honestly think this country is going to go one way or another. And as a scientist and an eternal optimist, I think we're going to go the right way. And the right way is by an increasing embrace of the scientific ways of understanding things and also of an appreciation that science and religion ultimately can be in harmony. So I'm optimistic that that's how things are going to happen. There are always going to be people who oppose evolution, but I think ultimately this country can come out of the current debate with a better appreciation for the nature of science and a better appreciation of the value of religion. Right here, sir. How does evolution fit into the origins of DNA?